Well, it looks like uh, we have a, a great group here today. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for, for joining on this morning. Sorry, we're running a little bit late. My apologies. Uh, my name is Laura Markle. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Atlantic Chapter Director for the CCBC based in Halifax. Um, and uh, it's, it's um, sorry, our apologies for our, our lateness. Um, we've just uh, had word, unfortunately, uh, uh, Santa Ono, president of UBC, cannot be with us today. Um, unfortunately, his, his parents are, are not doing well, and we've just been informed of that. So uh, he sends his sincere regrets, and, and, uh, and, and it's unfortunate uh, that he can't join us today. But we'll, hopefully, we'll have other opportunities to hear from him in the future. Um, and also, uh, I know that we were very anxious to hear from uh, David Dingwall, president of, uh, of Cape Breton University. Um, and unfortunately, I, again, he, there's uh, a loss of a very dear friend and a community member. Uh, today uh, is, the, uh, is the celebration of life. So our, our sincere uh, condolences to David and our, our thoughts are obviously with Santa right now. Um, so without further ado, I, uh, I, I have Rhonda Lenton, president of York University here, um, and Paul Davidson, uh, president and CEO of, of Universities Canada, who uh, will be the stars of the show today. Um, I, I, so it, it'll be, I think it'll be, uh, regardless, it's going to be an engaging session and we're excited to, to have you all here today. Um, so thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I'd like to just first mention a housekeeping detail in this webinar format. Participants, except for the moderator and the panelists, will be on mute. But we do want your questions, and you can put any questions that you have uh, for the Q&A portion of this session into the chat box, and we'll get to them later in the program. And please be aware that this, uh, we are recording this session. As everyone here today knows, COVID-19 has put tremendous pressure on Canadian post-secondary institutions as they navigate this unprecedented time. The CCBC has been hearing from our members in higher education, and we wanted uh, to host this webinar to bring awareness to the challenging issues at hand and to bring our members together to provide a forum for discussion and how we can work together to support our universities. So many challenges lie ahead as they appeal to international students to remain committed to a Canadian educational experience. Chinese students, more specifically, make up the largest group of international students. And Global Affairs Canada estimates that international students added $21.6 billion to the Canadian economy in 2018 and the creation of 170,000 jobs. Canadian universities, and by extension, the Canadian economy, have long enjoyed and benefited from the contributions made by Chinese students on campuses and within our communities. Is there a sharing branding opportunity to ensure Canada remains a top destination for Chinese students pursuing their post-secondary degree? This is the focus for discussion today, and we are very fortunate to have Paul Davidson, CEO of Universities Canada, lead the session as our moderator. And of course, um, a very distinguished panelist, uh, Rhonda Lenton, President and Vice Chancellor at York University, joining us. Um, I, in the spirit of making the most of our time, I won't go into the details of their, of their very impressive career accomplishments. And I'm, I'm sure you've had a chance to review them uh, in our promos that we've been sending out. Um, and, but, but before I hand over the session to Paul, I would like to first thank very much University of Toronto and Roy Huang, who is here with us today, CEO of NOIC Academy, Beijing New Oriental Training, Inc who has uh, very graciously supported through a sponsorship for this event. Uh, without those sponsorships, uh, we, we can't do what we do. So uh, many thanks and gratitude to you. Uh, and just a quick reminder before I, I send, uh, send off to Paul, uh, please send your questions in the chat box and I will do my best to see if we can get them answered today. If not, I promise to uh, follow up uh, uh, following this webinar. So uh, over to you, Paul, to kick things off. Terrific. Thank you very much, Laura. It's great to be with you. It's great to see so many familiar faces. And for those that have your cameras off, I can read your names. And this really is a community uh, occasion. I would just say as we as we turn to the topic at hand that Universities Canada is pleased to be a member of the Canada China Business Council. We've benefited from the conversations that happen at this in this community. And I think Canada has benefited enormously from the work that everyone around this table has done to 
build strong and uh, dynamic relations uh, with China, not only in the economic space, but in other important aspects of our relationship. So we're grateful to the Canada China Business Council for convening this uh, meeting today, and it is very timely. If if anything, the last 120 days have taught us all to be a little more nimble, a little more dynamic, a little bit more able to, to roll with the punches. I'm very sorry that, that, uh, that David Dingwall can't join us because he is such a champion for this issue. And also Santa Ono has had to send regrets. Uh, uh, and uh, Santa has been a leader uh, both in Canada and internationally around the value of people-to-people uh, -people exchange. And those, those values continue to be important, particularly uh, given the issues that we're facing uh, in 2020. I am delighted that Rhonda Lenton is here. Uh, Rhonda is a member of the, uh, of the Board of Directors of Universities Canada. Of course, she's uh, a President and Vice Chancellor at York University. Uh, and uh, York is, uh, is one, of the, one of Canada's powerhouse universities. And so you're going to get a really good uh, perspective from Rhonda. I may put a few editorial comments in in the absence of David and, uh, and, and Santa. Uh, and we really look forward to the opportunities to have uh, questions and answers in exchange. So with that, um, I want to again say thanks to everyone for being with us uh, this morning and, and pose a first question to Rhonda. And, and Rhonda, it's, it's really a question of as, as Canada's universities have uh, dealt with the first phases of the pandemic and as, we get re and as we've moved 1.4 million learners online and we've, as we've implemented online learning for the spring and summer uh, terms, as you think ahead to the fall, uh, and as you think about the conditions uh, on campus, what sort of measures is York contemplating to make sure that international students and Chinese students in particular uh, can feel welcome and safe and secure? Well, Paul, first let me say that I really want to thank the Canada-China Business Council for inviting me uh, to join in on this conversation. It is incredibly important for all Canadian universities that we're having these conversations. Um, and that we're, you know, really nurturing and supporting our, our international students from China. Um, you know, I want to say that there's, in a way, two parts to that question. There's the piece about what we're doing to ensure student safety, and then there's the piece about what we're doing to ensure student success. And I want to say that in securing student success in every decision that we're making, we are putting students' health and well-being first and foremost. When the pandemic first hit Canada, we set up, as I'm sure other Canadian universities did, an emergency operations center based on experts who worked and, and continue to work very closely with public health officials at the city level, at the provincial level, uh, working with government, but also working with one another because they wanted to be sure that we were establishing best practices around safety, taking all the necessary precautions, and really, you know, to finish off the winter term and summer, within a very few days in some cases, we were able to support all of those students who decided that they wanted to return home. But we also put in place a strategy for all our international students who wanted to stay. You know, we still have several hundred um, students in our residences, international students, and many from China. And we worked out how to manage all of the food, how to relocate students in single bedroom residences, um, just so that you know, we could guarantee their safety. We've not had a single incident of COVID-19 um, on our campuses. And generally speaking, the universities have been incredibly um, safe. As we think about moving forward to fall, that's why in many cases, the universities made the decision out of a concern, and we, we track student surveys. So we, we're listening to what our international students, as well as our domestic students, we're listening to what they tell us and what their concerns are. And we know that health and safety is particular of concern to them as well as their parents. So that's why many of us made the decision that we would offer courses predominantly online in the fall so that it would allow students to make the choice about whether or not they wanted to come into Canada or they wanted to study from home. But um, for those students who do decide to actually come to Canada, we are already um, putting in place a whole plan, working very carefully with public health about how we would support the two-week quarantine, how we would support testing for students, how we would ensure that students would get access to the food and supplies that they would need. 
um, rearranging the campuses because of course we would love it if we could complement those online courses with some campus activities in small groups uh, again following the advice of public health we've done uh, an assessment of how much room in the class can you actually use if you need to keep the social distancing in place we've estimated about 20 percent of a class so we're rearranging how classes will function we're really thinking through the whole movement across the campuses um, what non-medical masks when would that be appropriate uh, when would you need ppe when would you need protective personal equipment so all of those provisions um, have been very much part of a plan that has been developed in collaboration with all canadian universities supported by universities canada with public health officials with government because first and foremost we want to ensure that our students um, are safe but I just want to flip for a second to the success part because the success part also means thinking through how we can ensure that we're offering students in this slightly more flexible format, this blended format of online with some um, activities that um, we make sure that we let all students know up front if there's any course that would have um, hands-on if it would require a student to come to campus or what alternatives might be available so we're providing all of those different provisions um, to our students because we want to be sure they have the same high quality rich learning environment where they are walking away with the same knowledge and the same skills that they would have if they were coming onto campus in person but of course, we're also very excited as we move forward that hopefully in a phased way, we'll slowly be able to increase the opportunities for on campus as well. Rhonda, that's, that's really terrific the way you emphasize both the safety and the success of students. And uh, that, that's important for domestic students, equally important for international students. And as I think back over the last several weeks, I know you and your colleagues have been working literally around the clock uh, addressing the immediate needs of students, but also putting in place the measures that, that will be necessary to have a successful uh, fall term. And it's, it's, you know, for those that haven't been on a campus recently, you know, university campuses are mid-sized cities with a high degree of complexity. And so just the, the sheer uh, level of concentration uh, to the logistic details is really important and really impressive. And the work that you've done not only around uh, the safety, but also the academic success of students. That Canada has a reputation in higher education that we're absolutely committed to, to reinforcing and living up to, regardless of the format of delivery. And it's, it's interesting because while some people are shy about speaking about it this way, international student recruitment is a globally competitive enterprise, and we are in a competition with other countries to attract the best talent around the world. And so Rhonda, as you think about the last several weeks and you think about what other choices international students uh, might have, um, are there things that stand out for you about Canada's approach to the pandemic so far and how we're moving forward in, in uh, uh, advancing higher education in a post-pandemic climate? So I think that one feature, frankly, that's always characterized and set Canada apart to some uh, degree is that we are known to be a very welcoming country, a very inclusive country, a very diverse country. Um, uh, on my university alone, you know, we have students from a huge number of countries uh, and universities around the world. And we've been working in a collaborative way to trying to maximize um, how our students can both make the decision if they want to study from home if they're not comfortable in coming right away in fall but also to ensure that they can have a very welcoming experience when they actually um, arrive in uh, Canada. You know, we've set up and, and many universities have had a number of these provisions already because it's our approach and our understanding about the value that international students bring to the richness of the student learning experience. You know, we promise our students, whether or not they're domestic students or international students, we promise them that they're going to have an international experience. And part of that international experience comes from the diversity of the student population itself. So we work very hard in setting up a number of ways in which 
we actually can promote that welcoming um, uh, environment when they get here. Just at my university, for example, we have a global cafe. We have ways in which we connect international students to domestic students, but international students to one another as well. We support our international students even before they arrive, pick them up at the airport, make sure that they arrive safely in their residences. There's a whole very comprehensive range of supports that we give our students because we know that it's about way more than just the learning experience that they have, that as important as that is, it's also about the total student experience that they have and whether or not there's a delay in some students being able to arrive in fall or not, eventually students will transition onto campus and we understand very much the importance of providing those kinds of supports before they even arrive but all the way through their time here and, and, and as alumni after they graduate. That, that's terrific, Rhonda. And if I might build on that a little bit and, and maybe uh, emphasize a couple of points as well that, you know, Canada does have a, a brand reputation for being high quality education that's safe, secure and welcoming in a dynamic, uh, progressive uh, society. And that endures pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. Uh, and that, that's a really important uh, attribute of our brand. Um, and I would just say, and people around this table will know it, that um, Reputation is hard earned and, uh, and needs to be hard preserved because it can change very, very quickly. If we look at some of the experiences of some of our international competitors where senior leadership was very disparaging of international students or sending out hostile messages about the, the, uh, the, uh, the role of international students, those signals are picked up very quickly by students and their parents around the world. And so in contrast over the last several weeks, you have seen universities provide care and attention to international students. As Rhonda said, several hundred still living on campus uh, throughout the summer uh, and, and being, having their, their needs net, met and addressed. You're seeing um, over 70 universities across the country creating emergency support funds for international students that can access uh, though, for those that are in particular need. And turning to the government's response, you'll have seen I think unparalleled innovation and flexibility while maintaining highest uh, immigration uh, integrity, but by enabling international students to, that are here in Canada to extend their work, their study permits, to broaden their work eligibility, uh, to be able to enroll online, to be able to enter Canada, those with student permits before March 18th have been able to come into the Canadian, into Canada, even when other travelers cannot. Those are all important measures and they're important signals to the world that in a world where borders are closing and some people are antagonistic to international presence, um, we, remain, we remain open. And I think that's a reflection not only of Canadian values, but of, of university values around the importance of people-people -people exchange, the importance of, of problem solving together across borders and across boundaries. Can uh, I just add something to that, Paul? Sure. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but I'm not sure whether or not you've mentioned the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And I think that's really important because international students are eligible and it's an indication of the emphasis that our government puts on the importance of supporting our international students and making sure that if we're launching programs to support them, that international students are going to be able to benefit. And you know, at my own institution, when we started to talk to some of our faculty colleagues, as well as some of our donors and our board members about some of the unique challenges that some of our international students were facing, students who might have wanted to to travel home to, to spend some time at home students who might have to now you know pay to come back um, we set up and they from you know, it was really a request from many of them well what could we do to help you know can we donate in some way and so as paul was saying you know york university set up a whole canada uh, a whole york university students relief fund ourselves we had an incredible outpouring of donations to that fund so that we're able to provide those kinds of extra supports to, um, uh, either to our students who may incur costs that they hadn't originally been uh, planning to incur. 
Rhonda, thanks for mentioning what York has done with regard to uh, creating its own fund. And I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by the alumni's desire to step up. And it, it makes you realize, again, how broad the university community is. It's not just fa students, faculty, and, and staff at any given time. There are deep roots in the communities across the country. And beyond the, beyond the alumni, and alumni across the country have stepped up really well, and in many cases, specifically to support international students. But so too is the business community and many of the business leaders around the table here today have stepped up in a variety of ways. Chambers of Commerce recognize that, you know, international students make a real difference in their communities. Um, we can do economic impact studies, but uh, I can assure you that the Chambers of Commerce and communities across the country are very interested in knowing just how soon universities will be able to get back to on-campus uh, learning. Uh, because of the, the very real economic impact that, that students of all kinds and international students in particular bring. Uh, thanks also for mentioning the CERB. It's, it, you know, when I talk to counterparts around the world and we do talk to colleagues in Australia, the US, uh, Germany, UK, on a whole range of issues uh, with regard to international education. When they hear that our government has said, yes, international students are eligible for the CERB, uh, that stands out. And again, to the question of brand reputation and, and how, we, how we continue to build that Canada brand even through a pandemic, those sorts of measures will be remembered by, uh, by students uh, and their parents around the world. Rhonda, I want to come back to the question of student success and, and the online experience. You know, we've talked about moving 1.4 million learners online in the space of 10 days. Um, and, and you know, another area where the Government of Canada has been flexible has been in saying that international students uh, can begin their studies online. Um, uh, and that, that, that is a, that's a great opportunity for the students and for our universities. Uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how the digital landscape is evolving at York and what some of the particular challenges might be around digital learning in the international space. You know, I want to say something about digital learning in general, because the pandemic has certainly resulted in an acceleration of our plans. But Canadian universities are known for their high quality education. We've got a reputation for that brand. And a number of us um, have been advancing innovation and pedagogy for some time and really thinking about how learning has changed and how deep learning has changed. And that has been leading us in any event to being able to offer more online uh, courses, what we often call the flipped classroom model that um, I've got, sorry, I've got some noise happening in the background, my apologies. Um, a flipped classroom model where we spend more time with students on problem-based inquiry, on experiential education, and you know, students able to get a lot of their lectures online. Well, the pandemic has obviously been an accelerator because an increasing number of our courses now have to be offered online for the short term. And I have to say that York has invested hugely in because we want to ensure that we're not only um, thinking about the courses in this next fall term or in summer, but we're actually wanting to leverage the investments even for the long term about how we can continue to drive pedagogical innovation. So we've invested hugely in our teaching commons, Every single fact, and this is not unusual. Most universities are doing this right now in Canada. Um, we, every faculty has increased investment in offering workshops, in thinking about different platforms where it would be possible to introduce, even in an online format, hands-on learning, so to speak, virtual experiential education opportunities. How is it possible to introduce the virtual international exchange programs? I've been so amazed by the extraordinary efforts by, pre, by faculty members demonstrating such creativity and how through an online format, you can actually still introduce opportunities for students to work together. You can put students in different chat rooms to working on problems that can come back. Let me just give you one example of um, a recent summer uh, uh, um, initiative that we undertook. You know, I think it's indicative of the success that we've been having with online that we are 23% over our targets for courses in the summer. Students have been asking for us to offer more because they are working so well. And in one of our Schulich 
business courses, for example, because when we offer experiential education as part of the learning environment, there's often opportunities to also help the community. And given what's happening with the pandemic, a lot of small businesses have really been suffering because they are not, they don't have um, an, an online, they haven't transitioned their business online. And so knowing that the success of so many businesses is going to depend on their ability to, to transition to online and whether or not that was going to be through online orders or it was going to be through curbside pickup. These small businesses really didn't know how to manage that. Through a, a shop here program supported by the City of Toronto, all of these students in the Shilluk School of Business have been given this experiential education opportunity where they work with a small business and they help that small business learn about e-commerce, about how to transition their business online. So that's just one of a hundred examples that I could give you about the innovative ways in which through online, we are maintaining our commitment to that pedagogical, innovative, um, uh, international opportunities, experiential opportunities. And uh, I'm really impressed that over a thousand of our course instructors have signed up for online workshops. Uh, we've got champions of online, uh, they're mentoring their colleagues. Um, you know, it's telling, I think, that in a recent survey that we've done about students and that we've done with students, that over 75% of uh, students said that online education can be better or equally as good as in person. So we're taking all of those steps. In those cases where it's really difficult to transition, um, a particular kind of hands-on requirement is part of the, a student learning outcome to online. That's where we're looking for opportunities to bring small groups of students onto campus um, with all of the public safety measures that you know we've got approved so that in the case of for example some arts studios or science or engineering labs that we're still able to bring those students together in, in many smaller groups if there are some students who are really not able to attend in fall all those courses will very clearly say when there is a hands-on <coughs> on-campus experience that's required for students who really cannot come in fall, we are now changing our, the whole way in which we schedule our courses. Normally, we would schedule certain first term courses in the fall, and then the, you know, the, the, the follow-up course would be scheduled in the winter. Now we're making sure that we're running all of those first year courses in the winter as well, so students can think creatively about which courses they could take online in the fall and which courses they might want to leave until the winter for those students who were not able to attend in fall. So universities are really planning the way in which we deliver our courses, how we're scheduling our, our courses, um, enhancing uh, online uh, delivery and other kinds of remote instructions where possible, complementing that those plans with some hands-on activities on our campuses in small groups because fundamentally we want to be sure that you have the same rich student learning experience. We also want to be sure that you can progress through your program at the same speed that you would like to progress. We continue to talk to our students. We just recently did um, a special town hall with our, some of our incoming international students to get their input on what they would hope to see. Um, and it's not only about the learning piece, I, I should say, but it's also about the co-curricular and the extracurricular. How, what are ways in which we can bring students together so that you can have that engagement uh, with, your, with your peers? What are the ways that we can still bring students into having uh, conversations and working with future employers? Well, a lot of our experiential education has students already working with not-for-profits or with the private industry on different kinds of problems. So much of that can still perfectly be done through online, and we're managing all of that transition uh, in preparation for the fall. Uh, Rhonda, that's a really impressive set of interventions around ensuring the high-quality online experience. And, uh, you know, again, just, just thinking about some traditional stereotypes of universities where people 
think of universities as being uh, older institutional uh, enterprises that are slow to change. That's shown remarkable innovation and remarkable dynamism in just a few short weeks. And you know, credit to your leadership, credit to the faculty who have stepped up in really uh, uh, innovative ways. And also for putting the students first and the students' needs first. Uh, Often there's there's a criticism of universities that 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 we have become too large and that 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 it's the machine that's running. But what I've seen at York and what I've seen at other universities is real care and attention to the individual student, particularly the international students, whether they're still present in Canada or wanting to come, and seeing how using digital technology we can uh, strengthen our engagement, uh, maintain our engagement uh, with students, and also build community even before the students arrive. I think that's that's a a really important aspect of of uh, of what's happened on campuses across Canada in the last in the last several weeks, and that's going to be continue to be important as uh, as we navigate uh, uh, the pandemic, whether it's the first wave or, or subsequent waves. So knowing that that this the emphasis is on making sure student success and using all the digital tools available to to uh, reinforce that. Could I could I add one point, Paul? I don't want sure. to forget. Part, I'm sorry, but sure. It's also about having an appreciation for the different circumstances that students might be facing in terms of the technology, the top technology that they have, um, laptop needs, um, whether or not there's sufficient bandwidth in different countries. So we are looking at securing a dedicated v a VPN. We are in touch with our international students about whether or not they have difficulties with the technology they need. You know, when we transitioned the winter uh, courses, we had to transition within a few days, you know, when COVID uh, really hit Canada. And uh, in order to ensure the safety of our students, we wanted to, to be able to allow those students to finish their courses online. A number of our students uh, gave, we set up um, an office that students could call into or, or text with. And we found out that a number of our students really did not have sufficient laptop uh, access. We immediately went out and we bought, I think it was 1,500 additional laptops. We set up a laptop uh, a borrowing program that students could borrow the laptop until they finished their courses. Uh, some students were in circumstances where they didn't have access to sufficient bandwidth. Uh, we then went out and purchased, um, I always forget what they're called, little keys that you can kind of um, put in uh, to, your, uh, to your laptop. So we're not just thinking about the learning environment. We're also wanting to make sure that students have access to that learning environment. Yeah. And we'll be intending to work again with all of our students that have enrolled at the university to make sure that they do have uh, what they actually need uh, to be able to um, do these courses. And it really helps us if there's any future, you know, if there were to be uh, a second wave or if there were to be any kind of cases um, that were to happen throughout the world. It's going to well, this kind of flexibility that we're building into the delivery of our programs would allow us to pivot very quickly. If you know, students, some students decided that they were here and they wanted you to go home, they needed the technology to take with them. So I think we've, we've really learned a lot uh, in the transition of winter and in the summer. And all of those lessons that we learned are coming to bear in how we're very thoughtfully planning fall. And, and starting to think through to the, to the next winter term. That's, that's terrific. And that ability to pivot, that ability to be nimble and flexible is going to be important for every institution uh, going forward uh, uh, beyond the higher education sector. I do want to make sure we've got some time for questions. I know people are very keen and I would, I would just touch as we, as we segue into the next question to say that we also appreciate that there are particular challenges around digital outreach to, to certain countries. And so we're also working well to, uh, to make sure that we can address those in, in ways that provide a rich uh, student experience and, and also uh, uh, are, are appropriate for, for uh, the, the context we're working in. Um, you know, this October is an important milestone in the Canada-China relationship. Uh, it will be the 50th anniversary of formal relations. Um, I know that many, many parts of Canadian society have been looking forward to uh, marking that, to celebrating that. Um, and, and that that anniversary will be an important milestone. It is a chance for some reflection. 
It's, it's uh, and perhaps inflection. And it may not be exactly what we had hoped it, it might have been even just a few months ago for a variety of reasons. Uh, but as you think about a 50 year relationship between Canada and China, and you think about the role of higher education in that relationship, Rhonda, are there things that you're particularly proud of in, in terms of York's role or in terms of the higher education community? You know, I, I've, I've always been of the view that higher education is so incredibly important for country to country support, country to country relations. And you've seen that historically, even when sometimes there are tensions between countries, that universities act as a bridge of collaboration, of a bridge of diplomacy, um, because it's about people to people ties. And York has such extensive relationships, as do other Canadian universities, with other universities, with other faculty members throughout China. And these relationships are incredibly important. And you saw that even through COVID-19. You know, we were really struck by the kinds of collaboration, not only on working together for a vaccine, for example, or understanding um, COVID-19, but just on how we were collaborating around, for example, personal protective equipment. You know, our partner, Kwandong University of um, Foreign Studies in China, they uh, donated PPE to us, not only for use for us, but we were also able to share some of the um, uh, sur surgical masks with some of our local partners uh, in, in healthcare and the hospitals who were really in need. So it, it goes beyond even just the collaboration around exchange programs, the collaboration around international programs, uh, dual degree programs, the enormous collaboration around research partnerships. But it was also that kind of person-to-person -person collaboration that we were all responding to, you know, a situation that we've never, well, not, not actually for, for, for many, many years, a situation like we've been facing now. Um, and you still see that kind of collaboration um, taking place. I do want to say that from a research point of view, I think it's significant that not only do we have huge research partnerships, um, York is known for the our steady growth of the last number of years of uh, journal articles that are co-authored with international authors, many of whom are in China. But uh, China has donated, they've made um, commitments to research projects that are undertaken here in Canada or that are supporting collaborative uh, arrangements. We have a, a very well um, established uh, York Centre for Asian Research. That's really one of Canada's largest and most active community of scholars that are working on East, South, um, Southeast Asia, as well as Asian migrants um, around the world. And I wanted to mention, um, I was just trying to look for the exact uh, amount. Last month, the centre received a half a million dollar donation from the Canadian philanthropist and entrepreneur Vivian Coy. And that was all to really create an endowment that would support student engagement and hacker research and scholarship. I, there are so many examples that I could give um, from a research point of view um, that in terms of our partnership, but even on COVID, um, between um, uh, China and, and Canada. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wee Yang is a professor in our Department of um, Engineering, and uh, he's got the iFlight Fly Tech Endowed Chair. That was also established from a generous $1.5 million donation from a Chinese-based software company, a software term called iFly Tech. So, I mean, I, there's a, a huge list. Uh, we have, you know, um, Shulik has a campus in China. You know, it's just, this is the kind of close relationship that we have that continues to bode well for the future as we continue to work together and a real appreciation of the importance of China as a strategic partner for York University and for many other universities in Canada. Rhonda, thanks very much. And, and I'd, I'd love to chat further about this, but I believe there are questions and I want to make sure we have time for that. Uh, Really appreciate this, Rona, and, and I think I'm turning to Laura now to see if there are questions that you wanted to pose. Is that right, Laura? Yes, yes. Thanks very much, Paul. Thanks very much, Rhonda. Um, really engaging discussions. And yes, we've got some some enthusiastic, uh, some very good questions here. Um, but before I just uh, I, I mention a few of them, um, I just want to say for, for people who are a little bit late um, coming in, 
dialing in. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's it's very unfortunate. Uh, David Dingwall, president of Cape Breton University, has sent his sincere regrets. He he very much wanted to be here. However, he uh, a very dear friend in the community uh, has passed away, and he is uh, he's at the celebration of life service today. Uh, and also uh, Santa Ono, uh, president of UBC, uh, his his is having a family. Uh, his parents aren't aren't quite well right now, so it sends his sincere regrets. And I just want to reassure everyone: we will have more of these coming uh, coming down. Uh, we'll hope to have them back. And of course, Rhonda and Paul, thanks thanks very much. Um, so without further ado, I've I've got some really interesting um, really interesting questions here. Um, we have. Uh, let's see. Um, how many international? Thanks for your great insights. How remote? How remote international student exchanges? What What will in remote international student exchanges tend to look like in the future? If you can envisage that, and I guess Paul or Rhonda, which which if you want to grab I, that I, one, I would turn to Rhonda on that because Rhonda was mentioning that uh, as part of the digital engagement, the online engagement work has is underway at York to to reimagine international exchange in a digital context. So I'll just turn it back to Rhonda on that. You know, I think it's really important to know that as we move further out and potentially there's a vaccine for COVID and people become increasingly comfortable with travel, I think that the student still plays, and this is what our student surveys tell us, students still plays a very high premium on actually having that exposure of being in another country. Um, you know, being able to understand the, the, um, the habits of another country, being able to see the sights of another country in person, being able to mingle, uh, you know, within the country, you know, uh, with others in the country. You know, and the amazing thing about Canada, because we are so diverse, is that people from around the world, and certainly this is the case for um, students coming from China, they can both get this wonderful experience uh, being inside Canada and understanding Canada and seeing the sights of Canada, but you don't have very far to walk before you could find yourself in, you know, the Chinese uh, hub of uh, Toronto, for example. We have, you know, the cuisine that's across the world, and it's really such a wonderful factor. But could there be a short-term period of time when at least some students don't feel comfortable to travel? They might want to defer that even though they do crave um, that opportunity. And that's why we're doing these innovative uh, 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 virtual international exchanges. So you know, fundamentally from a learning point of view, what you want is to be able to have access to professors, for example, that might be in a different country. And so can we work collaboratively with our partners? York has multiple um, partners with universities in China so that students could have access to the courses that are being taught by other professors, irrespective of which country um, the university is in. So I think that there are very interesting ideas that are starting to emerge. Even so, that could be like one course, for example. Are there ways that you could introduce exposure to leading sites in a country virtually and have conversations around that? So we're just starting to look now and rolling out this whole um, very innovative approach to providing global engagement online, virtually, remotely, so that some students who, again, who may not be quite comfortable um, in coming right away, can still have access to that diversity of, of courses and be sure that they can count those courses as part of their program. Great. Laura, are there other questions? Yeah. There, there are, uh, yeah, there, um, there's an interesting one here. Um, people are asking, are, are accepted students in China able to get their visa in China? I understand some Middle Eastern students are not able to. Perhaps I could uh, have a stab at that one, Rhonda, and, and if you'd like to elaborate. Um, this is an area where University of Canada has been working really hard with uh, IRCC, uh, Canada's uh, Department of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. And as I was saying earlier, we've, we've seen them working very, very hard and being very uh, both innovative and flexible while maintaining a, a, a very high uh, uh, level of rigor and integrity uh, to the immigration path. Um, 
one of the things I have to remind my members is there are many things we can influence, but the pace and scope of the pandemic is moving at its own pace and scope. So in certain parts of the world, Canada's visa application centers are closed. In India right now, they are closed because the pandemic is 10 or 12 weeks behind where, uh, where, uh, uh, where it is in Canada, for example. That said, in China, they were closed for a number of weeks earlier on in, in the January, February period, but they have now reopened and are working uh, in China, uh, uh, perhaps not at full capacity, but, but uh, regaining capacity uh, week by week. And similarly, uh, the, the, the Canadian staff of the department are working virtually from home. And one of the real assets of the Canadian uh, visa processing system is the electronic file management. So uh, provided people can get their application in, it can be navigated and worked on anywhere in the world. Uh, there are still some questions and some hurdles to be considered and the overall capacity is an issue and, and we look to the federal government to, uh, for further signals uh, about enhancing that capacity. But I'll tell one other anecdote that there was a time when the broader federal public service was on strike and the Department of Immigration uh, was concerned about that. We were concerned about that because it was just around visa processing time for students. And the department said, look, we're gonna apply surge capacity and we're gonna prioritize international students. And in those extraordinary circumstances, actually more international students visas got processed that year than in the previous year. So when, when the department says it's a priority, they can make it a priority. And every indication we get from the government is they're working around the clock, night and day, to process as many visas as possible. Many of the processing centers are open in China, uh, and but in other parts of the world, it really is a reflection of the state of the pandemic. And um, I know the government is committed to getting, getting them open as quickly as it's safe to do so and to restoring the capacity as quickly as possible. I just want to make sure that everyone on the line knows that when we transition classes offline, online, we also made sure that we transitioned all of our student services online. Yes. So, I mean, we are, all of our staff are here to support international students and to help our international students figure out all of the complexities of how they can try to advance their visa applications. Students who may have been planning to take English as a second language. Uh, that's all going to be offered uh, online. So we're here to help all of our international students. Rhonda, that's a really good point. I'm gonna go a little further if I may, Laura, on that, just to say one of the uh, perception problems we've had, and we're inviting the you know, 60 plus people around the call to help uh, correct the impression. You know, Canada's universities did not close. Canada's universities moved online. And so there are international liaison officers, there are international counselors, there's language instruction, there's, there's all the support that would typically exist is available in the online format. And, uh, and, it, and they're busy, they're hot. <laughs> exactly. My international office, it's wide open, it's there to yeah. help. Okay. Well, well that's, that's great. Um, and, um, and I guess sort of a, a, a good entree to, uh, to what we've just been discussing is, you know, is China's great firewall a barrier to students in China who need access to their online classes? This is, uh, I guess, I don't know if that's an easy answer or not. But. Yeah, Rhonda, I might, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. <laughs> We're having a Canadian moment here, yeah. after you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me just say that, you know, there are challenges in the relationship. And the last, the, last, the last question about the 50th anniversary, I think illustrates uh, 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 part of the answer. That Canada's universities were amongst the first of Canadian society to engage with China. And we have engaged through good times and difficult times. And we've engaged when governments were talking to each other and when governments were not talking to each other. Um, what I can say is Canada's universities are working very, very hard to make sure that Chinese students get access to as much of the content in a way that is safe and secure uh, and uh, as, as possible. And that there are, um, there are ways uh, being pursued. And these are conversations that are happening uh, quite candidly with the help of the government of Canada, with the government of China, and with, and, and with the appropriate authorities. Because we wanna make sure that uh, Chinese students uh, get access to the courses, that their coursework is recognized in China. Uh, and those are all steps that are, that are actively underway. 
I'll just turn it to Rhonda if there's other pieces that you want I, to elaborate. I think you answered that very well. And I have to say that the embassy here has also been incredibly helpful. And there's such a strong commitment, as I said, in we've got so many relationships between um, universities in China and in Canada. And those relationships are flourishing and they act as a bridge. And there's been good signs of collaboration in being able to work with China on how we can try to address issues around um, you know, making sure that students in China can, can access our courses. So we continue to work on that, but I'm confident that you know, the, the strength and the relationships that we've had between the two countries that higher education forges, and those people-to-people -people relationships um, will help ensure that students who are staying within um, China are going to be able to access our courses online. That's, thanks, thanks, Rhonda. That's great. I, I have, there are quite a few questions still coming in. Uh, it's just indicative of the critical importance of this discussion and bringing everyone together um, in the educational space here, talking about uh, this very important relationship with China and all that you've offered today. I, I, would, I would like to say that I, 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 I plan that this will be one of many uh, to come and the start of, a, of a, a robust discussion going forward. And we, CCBC, want to certainly support you through all that you've been doing. It's, it's quite something, the, the pressures you've been under. Um, so I, I, without further ado, I, I think I will, I will say thank you very much, Rhonda and Paul. Wonderful session. I, uh, but before we, before we head off, again, um, I, uh, it's, it's critical that we have um, wonderful sponsorships for these great events. And uh, Roy Huang, CEO of NOIC Academy and Beijing uh, New Oriental Training Inc. is with us today to say a few words about uh, his his company and his passion and and what he does to obviously help this help along this this important relationship. So Roy, I'll, I'll hand that over to you. Thank you, Nora. Uh, it's an honor to be provided the opportunity to speak to you today. I would like to express my gratitude to President Davidson and President Nanton. With your leadership and guidance, we will successfully and safely manage our international students. I believe. A special thank you to CCPC to give us uh, this opportunity. And my name is uh, Roy Nunfeng Huang, President and CEO of NYC Academy, located in Markham, Ontario. Our school and our global organization has been helping to promote Canadian post-secondary education in China since 2009. We have been directly assisting Canadian university in increasing in recruitment of international students from China every year. NYC Academy, formerly New Oriental International College, it's a private IB and OSSD international boarding school in the GTA, founded in 2004. And Neural Education and Technology Group is the largest private education firm in China. Its market value right now is over 20 billion USA dollars, listed at New York Store Exchange. NYC is directly linked to the Neural Group, which invested in and endorsed NYC as its first and only international school outside of China. What does that mean for Canadian university? In China, the Neuroental Group provides an educational service to close to 10 million Chinese students every year, 10 million. So NYC Academy has a very significant student pool as a resource. NYC has a led specific initiative to support Canadian universities. First, NYC Academy has a successfully organized and led Canadian Canada-China Overseas Study Forum for the past 11 years. We have successfully partnered with the Canadian government politicians who endorse a CCOSF initiative. We have been promoting Canadian education in China and we are proud to do so. Secondly, our school recognized the importance of international education sector during this crisis. We recently, for example, we recently wrote an official letter to MP Jingye to advise her to communicate with all federal ministries relevant to this important sector. So we did it actually. And it's understood that international education sector in Canada impacts about 30 billion Canadian donors. MP Jingyip currently sits on special committee on the COVID pandemic and also a special committee on Canada-China relationship. Both are key committee for today's conversation, I think. Finally, 
uh, all about online. NYC is glad to continue to promote Canada as a great overseas study destination for Chinese students. NYC started our online live teaching education model going back to early 2018 with an enrollment of 2,000 students right now and growing weekly. So our most recent goal is to fully establish an authentic and convenient Canadian University Pathway Program to help to recruit Chinese students. We will provide experienced and licensed teachers to lead interactive lessons live and online for our OSSD credit courses. Our University Pathway Program will maintain the highest professional standard for assessment and evaluation. This is very important. We are open to work with all Canadian universities with the University Pathway Program. During this uncertain time, during this time of crisis and limitation for in-person education, NYC Academy has a workable solution. We will provide access to life and online education to millions of Chinese international students potentially. We have the history as a school, the drive to support international education for Chinese students and the ability to provide a pathway for international students from China to Canada. We want Canadian University to partner with us. Thank you for your attention today. Please receive our content information from CC CCBC host. We will welcome further inquiry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roy. And I will be sure to uh, help along anything uh, to connect you uh, with everyone on the line today. And uh, Paul, did you want to say something? Uh, no, I just uh, wanted to, to thank Roy for his sponsorship yeah. and UFT for their support of this event. And to Rhonda, of course, uh, uh, Rhonda, there was going to be a panel of three and you and I did it. Uh, <laughs> I think we covered the ground well. And, uh, and thanks also to, C to CCBC for their work in convening these kind of forums to maintain the conversation, to, to continue the dialogue and to drive the relationship forward. And Laura, I know it's always frustrating when people want to ask questions that didn't get answered. Um, I'd love to make the offer that if you've got a list of questions, uh, York would be more than happy to uh, answer those offline and to uh, have you distribute those answers to all who uh, were on the call today. Well, that's wonderful, Rhonda. Thank you very much. There's there's a lot of uh, a lot of um, discussion on this. I and and again, I, I say it again. Um, I think we're going to be keen to do another part two. Right. So we're just we're just starting the conversation. Um, th many thanks to you all, uh, to Roy, Paul, Rhonda. Thanks for a wonderful session, and thank you everyone on the line for taking the time today to be with us. Uh, we we wish you a, a great uh, second half of the week, and I hope to see you all very soon. We've got lots of lots of programming coming down the pipe, so please watch our CCBC daily news updates. Uh, lots lots of interesting webinars to come. So thank you to you all again. Thank, thank, you. thank you all. Thank you Take care. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay strong.